Hi everyone, my name is Julia and I'm the volunteer coordinator at the Pacific Grove Museum of Natural History. Thank you for joining us for Digital Science Saturday, Water Wild. Now there are just too many amazing creatures in Monterey County's watersheds and in our ocean to highlight in just one video, but we're gonna try. So come join us as volunteers and staff talk about some of our favorite water creatures. To start things off, Mine is the California red-legged frog. They're found across California and they prefer slow-moving streams, ponds, um, pools, and marshes. They're an important link in the food chain because they serve as both predators and prey. They eat insects like mosquitoes, but they also serve as food for snakes and birds. And a fun fact about the California red-legged frog is that they're actually the largest native frog in the western U.S. They can grow up to about five inches. So come join us and learn a little bit more about the creatures around us. I'm Mark. I'm a volunteer at the Pacific Grove Museum of Natural History as a docent. And uh, one of my favorite animals in the area is the California newt, Torricha torosa. And uh, it's important for the local habitat, which would, it would be found in moist forests or, or uh, forest floors uh, or in freshwater streams. And uh, it's important because it eats mosquitoes, among other insects and uh, bugs and earthworms and vertebrates. And uh, it, an interesting fact about it is that its skin is highly toxic, uh, about a hundred times as toxic as cyanide. It has a neurotoxin in its uh, skin, muscles, and blood, and so you shouldn't, uh, shouldn't eat it. That's the only way it could kill you, but don't touch it. Hi, I'm Christine, and I'm a volunteer at the Pacific Grove Museum of Natural History. It is Water Wild Science Saturday and I'm here to tell you about one of my favorite creatures, the water strider. Now there are lots of water striders, over 1,700 species. Water striders are slender, that means skinny, predatory, that means they eat other animals, insects, you remember insects, three body parts, head, thorax, abdomen, three pair of legs, the front two hold on to the prey, usually mosquito larvae, the middle two row and propel them across the front of the water, and the back two steer and brake. They have antennae, and some even have wings. They are very, very cool. They can skate on top of the liquid water, and that's why they're my favorite. So where the air and the water meet, that's called surface tension. Surface tension is where the water molecules are packed tightly together, and that allows light objects to float right on the surface. You've seen it. Feathers in puddles, leaves on top of water, and the water striders skate on top. Most water striders live on freshwater. They live on ponds and puddles and lakes and creeks but there are some species of water striders that live on the open ocean far away from the land. They eat old dead things that are floating at the surface. Now, we're gonna try an activity together. You can do this at home. We're gonna need three twist ties and one little saucer or plate that will hold a little bit of water. Let's go outside. So, I have my plate, it's filled with water, I have my three twist ties, and now I'm going to twist them together. Once I two twist them together, I'm going to turn each of the bottom of the legs up. Because you notice the pictures of the water strider has a long part on. When you test it, make sure that all six legs are touching whatever surface you're trying out. And now, you're going to take it gently and place it on the, on the surface tension of the water. You'll know when it's floating because you'll see the shadow of the, four, of the six feet right underneath the water. You can add googly eyes, the three body parts, whatever you like to augment your water strider. Hi, 
My name is Mary and I'm a volunteer at the Pacific Grove Museum of Natural History and one of the things that I do for them is to monitor the black oyster catcher. This is an amazing bird. It's an intertidal bird and it can be found in Pacific Grove, Pebble Beach and also in Point Lobos locally. It's mostly uh, when the tide is in, it can be found sitting on a rock, so when the tide is out, it can be found foraging in the mussel beds. Um, the black oyster catcher is not entirely black. It actually has a black head, a brown body, pink feet, and a fairly long, very sharp red beak. And we almost call it like a crow with a carrot in its mouth. The other interesting fact about it is that it does not eat oysters. It eats mussels and limpets and clams and all the other interesting things that you find in the intertidal area when the tide is out. Um, once you've seen this bird, you'll never forget it. And I think that you will also love it as much as I do. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Hello. My name's Bill, and I'm a volunteer at the Pacific Grove Museum of Natural History. And I'd like to share with you one of my favorite aquatic or water animals. Now, since we can't be at the tide pools right now, I brought a friend to take the place of a real hermit crab. Here you'll see Pajuris. That's the name of a hermit crab uh, and you'll see that he lives in a snail shell. He has 10 legs. Two of them are large claws. He has two antenna and two compound eyes. Um, they live in the tide pools up and down the Pacific coast and around Monterey Bay. And here's the real size that their shell might be. They're much smaller. And the ones you'll find around Pacific Grove uh, will be in a black shell called a black turban snail shell. And that's the primary shell they use for a home. And why do they have to use that shell? Well, if you look at this little figure, here's the shell. The hermit crab inside has a very soft abdomen. That's the back portion of its body. Uh, it's not protected by a shell like the rest of the crab. So he inserts that ab abdomen into the snail shell and that protects him in the uh, rocky intertidal. If you saw one in the rocky intertidal area in a tide pool, this is probably what it would look like. You can see him in there. Uh, with other tide pool animals like anemones in the fish. Uh, what these crabs help us do is keep that tide pool clean. They scavenge dead things um, in the tide pool, but mostly they eat the algae that grows there. I hope you enjoy learning a little about the hermit crab.
Hello, I'm Athali and I'm a volunteer at the Pacific Grove Museum of Natural History. Today, I want to share with you my favorite organism, the sea otter. Sea otters can be found along Pacific Ocean coastlines, including right here in the waters of the Monterey Bay. They are actually members of the weasel family and are often seen floating on their backs in the water. Otters are one of the few animals known to use tools. They like to use rocks to smash open shellfish to eat. Sea otters also have some of the densest fur of any animal to keep them warm in the cold waters of a habitat like the Monterey Bay. One of my favorite museum exhibits is where you can feel how soft their fur is. Sea otters are central to the ecosystem of the Monterey Bay. Unfortunately, we found this out the hard way. Even though the Ohlone people used sea otter furs to keep warm, the first Europeans to arrive in this area began to hunt the sea otter to extinction. In fact, a hundred years ago, these creatures seemed to have disappeared for good. Without otters in the bay, the urchin and abalone populations skyrocketed, and because these organisms eat kelp, the once abundant kelp forest on the floor of the bay was reduced to almost nothing. Although they are still endangered, thankfully, the sea otters have returned to the Monterey Bay, and with them, the beautiful and iconic kelp forest. Hello. I'm Franca Rossi, and I'm a volunteer at the Pacific Grove Museum of Natural History. I would love to share with you my favorite organism, the mola mola, or ocean sunfish. The mola mola is found in the epiphyllatic, or sunlit zone, in the Monterey Bay. This zone is located 200 meters from shore. This distance is equivalent to half the length of a track. You may be fortunate to see a mola mola sunbathing on the surface of the water. I saw one kayaking in the bay and my heart stopped for a moment as I thought the protruding dorsal fin was that of a shark. Very little is known about the role of the mola mola in our marine ecosystem. It is hypothesized that they control the jellyfish population. Jellyfish, squid, and zooplankton are the few marine organisms eaten by the mola mola. Did you know that mola mola can produce more eggs than any other vertebrate? Up to 300 million. Newly hatched sunfish, which look like puffish, weigh less than one gram. On average, adult sunfish, like the one seen behind me, weigh over 1,000 kilograms which is equivalent to the weight of a car. Hi, my name is Patty, and I'm a volunteer with the Pacific Grove Museum of Natural History. I would like to share with you one of my very favorite creatures in the Monterey Bay, and that creature is the blue whale. Blue whales are incredible animals. In fact, they are the largest animal ever, and I mean ever, that have existed on our planet. Uh, that's larger than dinosaurs. The blue whale is 20 times the size of a T-Rex dinosaur, if you can believe that. Also, putting it in perspective, the length of a blue whale is the same length as a Boeing 737 plane. Imagine that. And in terms of weight, a, an adult blue whale weighs, on average, about 250,000 pounds. Incredible. So blue whales are summer visitors to our bay. They come uh, to feed during the summer. Uh, along their central coast, they're quite prevalent. And in fact, we have one of the larger populations of blue whales along our central coast. So that's what makes it very special. They will come into the bay when the krill is abundant. So in abundant years, you have an opportunity to see them up close from shoreline. Um, normally you would not, you would be on a boat seeing them further out in our waters. What's important is protecting our bay and our ocean so that the krill population continues to, to be abundant. And in that way, we are helping with our blue whale population to make sure that it thrives for future generations. Thanks for listening and have a great day. Hello, I'm Craig and I'm a volunteer at the Pacific Grove Museum of Natural History. Today I'd like to share with you one of my favorite organisms, plankton. 
there's really two major categories of plankton in the ocean. Phytoplankton, which are plant-like, and zooplankton, which are small animals in the immature stages of larger animals. Now, phytoplankton are mostly microscopic, single-cell, photosynthetic organisms, and they live suspended in the water. And like plants on land, phytoplankton take up carbon dioxide, make carbohydrates using energy from sunlight, and then release oxygen. That's called photosynthesis. Now, phytoplankton produce their own food, which is why they're at the base of the marine food web. In turn, phytoplankton are food for animals like zooplankton, krill, uh, Zooplankton, in turn, eat, are eaten by everything from sardines to manta rays and even gigantic whales. Now, phytoplankton can be found everywhere in Monterey Bay, but only in the top of the water column, only as far down as sunlight can penetrate. And that's about six to eight hundred feet. And did you know that phytoplankton generate half of the atmosphere's oxygen? And just as phytoplankton generate a huge chunk of the Earth's oxygen, they also absorb as much as half of the atmosphere's carbon dioxide. Now, whales and sharks and seals and sea lions and fish are the most conspicuous marine creatures. But plankton actually make up about 95% of the biological mass in the oceans. So we have to respect phytoplankton. They're really important.